union density was declining, there was this uptick in these kind of funny community-based worker organizations that were doing a lot of what we would consider to be our role, um, the labor movement's role, but they were, you know, they were largely outside of the labor movement, and most of them didn't come out of the labor movement. My sense is that's very different from the beginnings of the unemployed worker centers here. Um, so I'm going to, what I want a little bit about what these organizations are, are, are like. In a lot of ways, they're kind of these funny hybrids. They're a little bit of union, a little bit of settlement house, you know, like um, providing services and classes and places to meet. Um, a little bit of labor market intermediary, you know, some job training, some matching jobs with people. Um, all kind of informal and, you know, it's not like a lot of the people that I encountered in the worker center world, and this is changing now, had a lot of um, uh, analysis about, the sec about their sector. These were not trade unionists. They did not think the way we do about sectors of the economy, right? These were much more people who came out of other kinds of movements, and I'll say very often people walk in the door to these worker centers because Spanish is spoken, or Polish is spoken, or um, you know that people um, know that there's this community organization that's sort of like made up of people who um, who come from their uh, same experience. So there have been Mexican worker centers and Guatemalan worker centers and that kind of stuff. Sometimes they don't have names like that, you know, uh, but they that but they, but people know that that's an organization that they can go to that you know, that will help them and where people, they're very place-based, so they're local, right? They're like, you know, in a particular area. Um, the other thing is they don't bargain contracts, right? It's collective action, but not collective bargaining. They're, they're not unions, right? They don't do that kind of stuff. Focus on organizing um, and as well as service provision. Um, and there's a big, um, sometimes my labor friends who go to these worker centers want to kill themselves because there's such a heavy investment in process. Right, like you go to a meeting there and people will take hours because things will get simultaneously translated into two different, three different languages. You know, there's a lot of sort of celebrating diversity and explaining people's holidays to each other. And also, if you're dealing with really low wage workers, you know, some people come, what's so interesting, and I'm sure it's the same here that you guys know, is that I could be in one room with a group of 50 low wage workers at one of these worker centers. Let's say you know some of them are from Nicaragua, some from Guatemala, a lot from Mexico. Some of them have PhDs from their own country. Some of them are campesinos, right? They're from the farm, you know. They're from the um, the campo, you know. They've never done paid employment, right? That they're, they're all in the same room. These people would have had nothing to say to each other in their home countries, or they might have been on opposite sides of a civil war, like in El Salvador, in Nicaragua. You meet people who were in the army, and you meet people who were in the left, right? And they're all now they're kind of in the same in the same uh, place working together focus put on leadership development. Like, what does it mean for people like this to make the decisions within the organization while they have to learn how to read a budget sheet and an accounting sheet, right? There's a big focus on, um, in this movement, on um, grassroots democracy and on people making decisions and, you know, that kind of stuff. And, you know, obviously it's kind of a culture. If you want to be considered a member of this worker center, it's sweat equity, right? There's this there's this expectation, maybe not that you pay dues, but you've got to be active, you've got to come to training sessions, you've got to, you guys are smiling, maybe this is similar to whatever, but you've got to, you've got to like come to meetings, you've got to be active, you've got to go through certain sessions, and then membership is like an honor that gets bestowed. So in a lot of ways, they're like, um, if you'll pardon the expression, like, uh, like vanguards, right? Like, or something like that, right? That people become, but it's not open to everybody, you know, that kind of stuff. So part of what was, was kind of like, young organizer, somebody handed me this paper written by Cesar Chavez called On Money and Organizing, and it changed my life, you know, I was like this, you know, and it basically it was Cesar Chavez's case for why you always ask poor people to pay dues, right, that if people don't pay for their organization, they don't own it, that kind of thing. What? They don't value the team. Yeah, right, they don't value, right, the more you pay, the more it's worth. I work with in New Jersey, yeah, it gets foundation money, but they have a rule, which is that the rent and all the um, basic expenses of the organization must be met by membership dues, right? So, um, you know, you can augment that, but the basics have to be met by membership dues. You know, and so these guys take very seriously that they gotta raise that money every month from their members. Right? Is that, um, uh, I remember interviewing these women from the Domestic Workers Union in New York. This was hilarious, right? Going with these women in Central Park, you know, with the organizers. So they're, you know, they're basically recruiting nannies. So how does this work? They look for every woman of color pushing a stroller with a white kid, right? <laughs> right? And they walk up and say, hey, I'm from the Domestic Workers Union. So what's really interesting about that story is that those domestic workers, many of them with secondary migration, right? They were from the Caribbean, right? Or they were from 
um, the Philippines, then had gone to Hong Kong, and then had come to the US. A lot of these women had contracts in other countries they were in, right? They were used to domestic workers, of Immokalee workers, um, six immigrant workers from Haiti and Mexico and Guatemala borrowed space from a local church. The first case they took was a worker who got beaten in the fields for stopping to drink water. And they organized you know, a spontaneous 500 person to the home of the crew leader. Now we know the Immokalee Workers as an organization that created an international campaign and got Taco Bell and McDonald's and Burger King to, you know, to make their subcontractors require another penny per pound per hour that would go into a fund for raising the wages of these farm workers, right? Whoever thought that an organization, I don't know if you guys have ever been to Immokalee, I'll, I'll trust that you haven't. It's the closest to hell on earth I've ever been to, right? And so for people in this tiny little horrible who created this international movement that's actually been very successful, as a political scientist, challenges everything I know about what it takes to, you know, to thank God life is so much more interesting, right, than the, the theories we read. Provide services, because you know, there's a whole debate that probably is here too, right? In organizing, when I was a young community organizer and labor organizer, we were always told no servicing, right? It's not your job, you're supposed to organize. <laughs> Struggle is what will, you know, will get people what they need, right? I mean, all that, no servicing. But if you ever organize with poor people, you always do service. It's such a bull, right? It's like, you know, you, you can't not do it, right? So these organizations take on public sector targets like local government, state government, and they take on companies, right? Employers, one way or the other. That's their, um, so they're helping workers learn their, learn their rights, right? But then part of what they do is, let's say they win a wage claim, but the, but the employer doesn't pay up. They'll do actions on the employer, right? Standing outside with a sign that says, eat, drink, and feel guilty. You know, outside of a restaurant, you know, picketing. Um, these are incredibly effective, right? Because businesses that depend on foot traffic and reputation pay up, right? They'll go into somebody's neighborhood where they haven't paid their domestic worker, you know, and they'll say, Wendy Wessler owes her maid 30 grand. You know, and like Wendy Wessler's like, uncle, you know, here's the money, right? Just get out of my neighborhood. 